Hello all, uh, my name is Spencer Johnstone from Becca and that is based in New Zealand and today I'm here to share a case study investigation that looked at how modelling could reconcile mental health anti-ligature and fire engineering requirements. Recognising that this is obviously a, a pretty specific topic to fire engineering in New Zealand uh, and mental health facilities as well, I thought I'd just give a bit of high level background as to the current state of both of these uh, in New Zealand. Notably, uh, given the significant changes in global social media presence and the detrimental impacts that the COVID-19 pandemic has had, there's been an increased dependency on mental health services and this has resulted in New Zealand prioritising not only new build mental health facilities but also the refurbishment of existing. As part of that anti-ligature or the prevention of suicide and self-harm is crucial to the operation of these facilities and the protection of vulnerable service users. However, satisfying anti-ligature requirements often comes at detriment to the fire engineering requirements, given there's a risk posed by exposed fire protection fittings that don't exactly align with meeting anti-ligature requirements. So as a bit of a solution to this, New Zealand is currently applying and adopting a risk zone approach. Uh, with designated free areas or low risk zones um, being areas that are highly staffed, such as corridors or communal spaces. Uh, and these allow for standard fire protection fittings. However, your more high risk zones, such as bedrooms, still need to meet those anti-ligature requirements and that is one of the key challenges currently facing the industry. Commonly there are two solutions for this. Uh, the first is to use an aspirating smoke detection system uh, simply because this uh, limits the ability of service users to tamper with them. However, there is still that possibility um, which is, is one negative to their use and they also come with a high capital expenditure um, which isn't always suitable for refurbishment of existing projects where budgets might be a bit more restrictive uh, than the new builds. So the other alternative is to use smoke detector covers. Uh, we know that covers are going to impact the detected performance However, this hasn't actually been quantified with manufacturers requiring testing to the applicable standard um, in order to justify their use, or sometimes they are just qualitatively assessed in the fire engineering design, neither of which is, is really suitable. And that kind of created the base for this investigation, uh, which was to see if we could quantify the impact of a cover on detector performance using modeling. So based on that risk zone approach that I mentioned, uh, smoke detector covers are typically only provided in those high risk zones like bedrooms and therefore we restricted the assessment of the model to a given bedroom. The layout for this was produced by reviewing several existing and new facilities and taking an average on their size, um, which then formed this FDS geometry that you can see in the figure, meaning the length of it was 4.9 metres, the width 4.1 and a height of 3 metres. The detector was also placed in accordance with the New Zealand standard uh, for fire detection and alarm systems, which equated to a distance from the centre of the fire of about 3.8 metres. So having formed this geometry, um, we could then form the rest of the model and the general assumptions and parameters that we use for this can be seen in the table below. 
These are very specific to the New Zealand Building Code and compliance documents. Um, and so it is expected that changing these to reflect another country or, or code document would impact the results. But it's still considered that the broader analysis and framework approach that we've investigated as part of this would be relevant and could be applied uh, within these other countries' code documents. So the formation of that really relied on the HVAC model of FDS. Given anti-ligature covers can require as low as two millimeter perforations to meet requirements, which even if you account for that as a free area across the cover, generally it's too low to be resolved by a typical mesh resolution uh, unless you were wanting to do some pretty specific research into it and so hence why it hasn't been looked into in industry previously. Um, but given that the HVAC model can capture subgrid leakage as has been verified in the FDS user guide when looking at door leakage, um, it was considered that this could be applied to resolving that subgrid leakage for a smoke detector cover. So this was how we applied it, um, a standard HVAC duct or, or model on each face of the smoke detector cover, and it was assigned a area equivalent to the total free area of that cover. It's also worth mentioning uh, that these models all used a Heskestad ionization type model, um, reason being this relies on a single lag time uh, based on the free stream velocity and characteristic length of the detector. However, no manufacturers publish the characteristic length of their detectors. Um, so the FDS default was applied in this investigation. Um, the other important aspect to note as part of that is that a single lag time is, is often insufficient at velocities below 0 0.5 meters, uh, which I'll talk about later. So having built the model, uh, the next question was what smoke detector covers should actually be modeled. Uh, there was a bit of a review done online, um, and from that it was identified that those currently available vary significantly between companies and countries, not only in terms of bulk shape and size, but also their perforations. Given the smoke detector activation is reliant almost purely on smoke reaching the detector, it was considered that perforations are the more impactful parameter than either the cover shape or size. So this was chosen as the primary um, aspect of interest. And so we therefore uh, accounted for the total free area of a given smoke detector cover, um, since this would capture both the perforation size as well as their number. The data available online though for these factors was severely limited, uh, with only one cover being identified as having these dimensions necessary to calculate its total free area. Um, this is denoted as cover one in the scenarios and form the baseline from which the other cover configurations were varied. We didn't want to just look at the cover configuration though. Uh, we were keen to see if the on the dependence of the results on fire growth rate. And typically, it's particularly in New Zealand, a T-squared fire growth rate is applied um, as part of the performance-based approach. And so I also investigated the slow, medium, and fast T-squared growth rates um, to see how these impacted results, and the result of this being the 10 scenarios um, that we looked at. Focusing first on the cover configurations, this table identifies and summarizes these results, uh, assessed based on a time delay multiplier of the smoke detector activation relative to an uncovered detector. 
noting that this was taken at 20% obscuration um, to align with New Zealand compliance documents. As you can see, cover two showed essentially an equivalent performance to an uncovered detector. And this is due to its significantly larger free area, uh, which would actually make it an anti-tamper cover as opposed to an anti-ligature cover and wouldn't meet New Zealand requirements because of that. Um, all other covers, in particular, cover one is an anti-ligature cover, showed a considerable delay in the detector activation as much as two times that of an uncovered detector. Looking at this graphically, uh, we can see that this delay is considerable throughout the simulation, uh, although it does become more pronounced as the simulation progresses. Importantly, however, uh, as has been applied in previous fire engineering designs I've seen, it's not as simple as saying we could reduce the sensitivity of a detector to give it an equivalent performance of an uncovered detector. As you can see in the graph, this would require an th alarm threshold of approximately 1.5% obscuration, which is just not currently achievable with the detectors currently available in market. Uh, but more importantly than that, it's just not a practical solution given the rate of spurious alarms that would occur at this threshold. And to add to that, this approach would also remove the inherent safety factor that is currently in models as, as part of the performance-based design in New Zealand. Uh, the reason being that most physical detectors have a typical alarm threshold of 7% obscuration, whereas the New Zealand compliance documents call for um, us to assess alarm at 20% 20 20 obscuration. Looking now at the fire growth rate models, um, you can see that this maintains the relationships evidenced in the cover configuration results. Uh, interestingly, however, though, there doesn't seem to be any clear correlation between the fire growth rate and the time delay multiplier with each of the medium fast and slow T squared fires having approximately the same time delay um, which suggests that cover free area is the governing factor uh, in this investigation. Given the significance of these results, um, we did also want to test the sensitivity and accuracy of the HVAC model approach. So this was done by refining the mesh, uh, which allowed for rather than using the HVAC model and modeling subgrid leakage, we could use passive holes through the detector cover, um, given the increased mesh resolution, and use that instead as a means of determining the smoke detector cover delay. So as you can see from the graph, um, there's approximately a 20% difference between these two approaches at its maximum although in, for a significant portion of it, it is less than that. So if we were to apply that uh, difference broadly to the previous results for cover configurations, an anti-ligature cover could reasonably be expected to delay smoke detector activation by up to 2.3 times that of an uncovered detector, which is significant. Um, in terms of the reasoning behind that, if we take a look at that slice file in the slide, you can see that velocities within the bedroom don't exceed 0.5 meters per second, uh, which, as I mentioned before, it means the Heskestad ionization detector might not always be suitable, um, as previous research has suggested a more dual lag model would improve the accuracy of the results. Um, so that presents something that could be investigated further in future. So to summarize, um, current anti-ligature smoke detector solutions aren't really fit for purpose in New Zealand. The, the aspirating detector system is expensive uh, and still causes operational challenges, whereas smoke detector covers as of yet require physical testing, which is still an expensive avenue 
or a just qualitatively uh, assessed, which is not really suitable given the vulnerability of users. What this study has shown, though, is that the FDS HVAC submodel uh, can quantify the impact of a smoke detector cover, with the initial results identifying this could be up to a 2.3 times delay that of an uncovered detector. It's also worth noting that increasing the smoke detector sensitivity alone is, is not the answer, um, given the likelihood that this will introduce spurious alarms and the threshold level required to get an equivalent performance to that of an uncovered detector. It's just, it's just not feasible at this stage. So round out, um, the study provides a framework for how smoke detector impact cover impacts could be quantified. I do want to note though that it shouldn't be used directly in design in terms of a 2.3 times delay. Uh, that is very specific to the New Zealand code, uh, as well as the particular models that were run in this case. Uh, obviously, bigger rooms, different spacing, and that sort of thing will, will impact the results. But I do think that this shows not only is it possible to quantify the smoke detector impact, uh, but also that it should, given the size of the impact it can have. Thank you. Hey, Spencer, you hear me okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. It's a little quiet. Yep. Um, thank you for the talk. Good, great topic. Um, I think we may have a couple of questions here. Yes. So just one minute while we get a microphone to them. Who was it? Kevin. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. That was a good talk. Um, when you put the cover on the smoke detector, I think essentially you're creating this more complicated smoke detector that we we actually include in FDS. I mean, there's this two parameter uh, variation on the one parameter variant that you used. And as I understand it, that two parameter model was based on the assumption that there's a certain time lag to you know get the smoke into the uh, obscuration chamber and then there's a certain you know other time associated with the you know detection itself so it seems to me like you have essentially two characteristic times one to penetrate the outer cover and then one to penetrate the inner cover so i mean maybe you know you could try dispensing with the hvac model although there's nothing wrong with that but potentially you can just view the detector with the cover on top as a you know a more complicated smoke detector that would require the more complicated um you know activation algorithm that's just a comment yeah no, i appreciate the thought thanks um the reason i steered away from using that clary model was more around the unknown nature of what that detector lag time would be whereas using the HVAC model could apply a free area based on the free area of the detector and try to quantify that detector lag time mm -hmm. through that aspect rather than um, trying to estimate or, or guess based on the, the Clary detector lag. Right yeah I mean the way those parameters are determined is um, the detector is put into a a tunnel you know that's maybe half a meter by half a meter on a side and you know smoke is blown through at different velocities and different concentrations and you know the data is reduced until you come up with you know those parameters it's a it's a fairly um uh, i mean it sounds simple but it's you know difficult to actually do because you need a nice calibrated wind tunnel in which to do this work but let me go to see uh, go see Charlie Fleischman at uh, <laughs> University of yeah. Go to Christchurch, Charlie. go see Charlie, and uh, have him do it for you. Yeah. Tell him I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank. Anything else? Other questions? No. Okay. I'm not seeing any here. Um, we'll say there's the one issue with the. I think with that. Two, two parameter model, which does depend on a certain amount of velocity, uh, ceiling jet velocity to 
you know, be more accurate. It kind of needs some driving force to get that in there. And when we've seen like smoldering fires or low velocity fires, it starts to, the assumption of the model starts to break down a bit. So, um, to, yeah, to help that out. Yeah, okay, yeah, so Kevin was just saying that's what this two parameter model was supposed to address is the slow flow, so, okay. Um, well, I don't see any more questions, so I'll let you go. And thank you for tuning in and the great talk. We appreciate it. Right, appreciate it. Take thank care. you.